chapter 1, and uh, let's uh, start in verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Mm -hmm. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, Christ in you, mm -hmm. the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So I'm going to try and finish the chapter tonight. And just for the record, this is my third week trying to do that. So we started in you know, verse 23, the issue, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel, of course, is found in Jesus Christ and ultimately the rapture. But so often when Paul uses that issue of, ho of hope, he's talking about what we the, the, the event that we call the rapture, um, which is vested, of course, in Christ. And if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, you won't be moved away from that. Right. But if you go back one verse, he talks about in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in his sight. Well, we've looked at this. Those are, those are characteristics or definitions um, of, of, of who you are in Christ. Those things are your identity in Christ. You are holy in Christ. You are unblameable in Christ. And you are unreprovable in Christ. So the issue here is your walk. Mm -hmm. Is your walk. And, and, and the, re the reward that, it, that there is. He can't present you holy and unblameable and re reprovable if you don't continue in the faith grounded and, set, and settled, right? And we're talking about an opportunity of, of reward. The the guy that gets that, that gets saved on the on his deathbed. I mean, he there, there's not a whole lot there for to work with, right? Because he got saved and then died, mm -hmm. and and so we, w again, this issue this is not an issue of, of the person losing their salvation. This is not an issue of anything like that. This is the issue of reward. You know, the lost opportunity for reward. And he comes down, verse twenty four talks about how he suffers for the for the church's sake. And then he starts talking in verse 25 to the end of the chapter about his distinct ministry. There's something unique about the ministry of the Apostle Paul that wasn't revealed to anybody else. He didn't get it from Peter. He, he got it from the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and then on some subsequent, um, subsequent revelations. He says he, he, got, he, got, he didn't get all the information on the road to Damascus that day. Right. He got a good portion of it and then he went into the desert and and all that but he got revelations as, as time went on and and that of course we understand that we now have the completed word of God but if you notice too in verse 25 he says whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God so he was he was made a minister he says so let's, let's look at a couple of verses here Look at Romans 11. Oh, excuse me. Romans 11 and verse 13. Because there were other ministers that were preaching the dispensation of the grace of God. But Paul got it first. Right. Nobody ever got it before Paul. Mm -hmm. Romans 11 verse 13. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am what? The, the apostle. apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Okay, so the issue is he is the apostle of the Gentiles. The information regarding the dispensation of grace, what he calls the mystery, which we'll look at in a minute, that, that we live in today, he is the apostle of that information. He's the one that has that information. Peter and the twelve the, the eleven, the Peter Peter and the twelve, they don't have that information. Mm -hmm. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm -hmm. Paul's preaching the gospel of the grace of God. They're different gospels. In Galatians, it's called the gospel of the uncircumcision versus mm -hmm. the gospel of the circumcision. Two right. different gospels. Okay. But he says, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. 
So what dispensation is that? Well, look back at Ephesians 2, through Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, and verse 1. You know, this is, this is such an important um, thing to understand here. People's lives, Christian lives, would operate so much better if they understood that, you, that Paul is their apostle, right. that the information for us today was revealed to Paul mm -hmm. and through him to us. The whole Bible's for us. It's just not all to and about us. Okay? Look at chapter 3, verse 1 of Ephesians. 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Well, there's the dispensation that was talked about in Colossians that was given to Paul. Okay? Back in Colossians, the exact phrase he used um, was according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me. Okay? That is the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me given me to you word. Verse 3. How that by revelation he made known, that's Jesus Christ is the he there, he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul, Jesus Christ revealed some information to Paul that was a mystery. Nobody ever knew it before until it was revealed to Paul. With the, the, the mystery, that's pretty much uh, having to do with the body of Christ and I mean once in heavenly places the, the like after the rapture I mean uh, the, how that the body of Christ will be active in heavenly places the, 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 the mystery specifically is down in verse 6 the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel now that's the mystery so once in that's Yes, and then it incorporates the mystery, incorporates other things. There are other things that are, there's like 13 right. identifiable mysteries in the Bible. They're, they're not all the same. Okay, but now Paul does talk about some things that are a mystery. Uh, the rapture, what we call the rapture, right? The, the better term for it's the day of redemption. In Corinthians, he calls that, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, that's not the mystery, but that is a mystery that is part of the mystery. The mystery is the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same bodies and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, every time we read this verse, I tell you guys, it does not say that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with Israel, which is how this verse is taught. Well, now we're just fellow heirs with Israel, and that's not true. Israel's hope is to be on the uh, on the earth, and that God is going to use Israel to reconcile the earth back to himself. He's going to use the church body of Christ to reconcile the heavenly places back to themselves. Okay? And uh, and of the same body, that's the church body of Christ, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That promise is eternal life. So in, in eternal life, that's where you'd start talking about things pertaining to the rapture, right? Because somehow we have to get to heaven, for lack of a better word. If we die, we get caught up. If we're alive and when at that moment when it happens, we're caught up. Okay? So yeah, that, that distinctive... Paul calls it my gospel, the mystery, the glorious gospel of, of Jesus Christ, and things of that nature. They all involve the dispensation of the, of the grace of God and the uniqueness of the church, the body of Christ. Pete, Paul never taught the same message Peter did. Right. Ever. Well, here's the thing of mysteries. Oh, there's a list right there of yeah. mysteries. Yeah. I thought about that. And it, it, people, people want to say, well, well, Peter and Paul taught the same gospel, but they didn't preach the same gospel. And, and time and time again, you, you can see that. If you look over at Acts 10... Well, when he went to Jerusalem there, he contended with the apostles. There was a little bit of a debate. There was a, exactly was a debate. And they, they finally came to understand what Paul was doing. Paul, depending, you know, Everybody says, well, Peter told Paul to come on up. When you go read Paul's account, Paul says he went up by revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you go up and see him. Now, Peter, just said, there's some people came down and said, hey, we think we should have a meeting. But he didn't go up because Peter wanted him to go up. He went up because the Lord Jesus Christ made a revelation to him and said, I went up by revelation, and I told Peter what I'm doing. Peter didn't tell me what to do. I told Peter what I'm doing. And Peter understood it, gave me the right hand of friendship, 
said he'll go to the circumcision, I'll go, and I should go to the uncircumcision. Right, and, he, and, he, and Paul says there too that he, he wasn't swayed by what Peter. That's right. Yeah. He, he's actually stronger than that. We'll go look at. It. If you remind me, we'll go look at it. Yeah. He says, "They that were of somewhat had nothing to add to me." Yeah. That's a strong statement. Yeah. You go to your. One truck stop. You go to another truck driver that has an immense amount of experience, knows what he's talking about, is not a, a, a is not a novice, and you meet with him, and you walk away and say he had nothing to add to me. That's probably not a compliment to that person, even if you just think about it in your in your mind, right? right. And that's what he said to Peter. Peter had been with the Lord Jesus Christ for three years, forty days of intense Bible study after the after the crucifixion. And Paul says, Peter added nothing to me. Yeah. Because what was, and now let's get the context. What was Peter going to add? Well, he was going to talk about repent and be baptized. He was going to add the yeah. law. Right. Right. That little flock was going to add the law to right. grace. Well, and then in 2 Peter, what, what Peter says is that what Paul has to say is something that's kind of hard to understand. Because so it was so unlawful. Right. It, it was hard to understand. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it, it let me. Look at uh, look at Acts ten, you know the, the one everybody wants to go to and say, see, Cornelius was the first one to go to a Gentile with the gospel of the grace of God. So um, Stephen gets stoned in Acts seven, Paul gets saved on the road to Damascus in Acts nine. Mm -hmm. So now we come to chapter ten, and we see Peter going to a Gentile. There he says, see, this is Peter, but. But pay attention to every word that gets said here. Mm -hmm. Acts ten verse thirty four. I'm not going to read the account. You you know you he sees the the unclean to him the unclean meat come down three times and, and, and all that. He gets over to Cornelius or to uh, the what's this guy's name? Yeah, Cornelius's house. In verse thirty four. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Is that the gospel that we preach today? If you work righteousness, God will accept you? That's not the gospel of the grace of God. That's the gospel of the kingdom right there. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's what, it's Peter talking. Right. But in every nation, the Peter's not saying you're accepted by grace. He says if you if you yeah. work righteousness. Yeah. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say that to Cornelius? Because Cornelius was doing it. Well, yes, Cornelius was. A, there was people that he, he was showed up at Cornelius's house to affirm what Cornelius had been doing. Yeah, he had been blessing Israel. Yeah, and therefore he's not going to receive that blessing. That's why the, the Holy Spirit comes on on this Gentile, and he hasn't been baptized yet. And Pete goes, "Oh, no, no, no that's not right." So he hurries up and gets him baptized. Right? It, it doesn't make any sense to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you look at Ephesians 2, Ephesians 1, that just said if you work righteousness, you're accepted of God. Ephesians 1, verse 6, Paul says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. You're accepted. If you, the moment you got saved, the moment you believed Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for your sins, boom. You got saved, you got sealed in the, hill, in the Holy Spirit, you got put into the church, the body of Christ, got put into Christ, and that verse just tells you and you're accepted of God. You can be the worst rascal ever, but in Christ you're accepted. Yeah, right. Nothing about working righteousness for right. accept for, for salvation. Now, there is a way we are to, to, to live our life, but out of gratitude, not out of debt. Right? When Israel would do something, they had to live that they would live a certain way so that they received the blessing. In that same passage you're in, look how many blessings you, you've received. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We've already got all the spiritual blessings we're going to get. We, it's not that we can go out and work righteousness and God's going to say, hey, he was really good today. Let's give him an extra double helping today. Now, as you walk through life, though, you come to understand those blessings that you've got right. and appropriate those blessings and let them work for you, right? Mm -hmm. The moment you got saved, did you know all this stuff? 
No, you yeah. just knew you weren't going to hell, right? You got what we call your fire insurance. That's all you knew. And that's okay. You have so to get in and study yeah. to find out all these things that you have. Because what's, what's the natural reaction to, for somebody? They believe somebody shares the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, rose again. And if you just believe that simple message, then God will save you. Somebody says, okay, I, I'm, I believe it. They genuinely believe that. What's the next thing? i got to be good. Yeah. Even if I should have to go do something. Yeah. Even if it's just to show my appreciation. Uh -huh. Right? And we start thinking about, okay, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Well, it's a natural thing to, to think that way, I think. But then also, yes. we is being reinforced by our teaching. Yes. That's right. Well, and our reading. I mean, I was reading the whole Bible after I got saved. I was pretty excited. Yes, right. But, but I must... I didn't realize there was a division there. Right. See, most people will tell you get somebody saved and say, "Okay, now go read the Book of John." If you want to teach somebody to lose somebody that's a novice to lose their salvation, go have them read the Book of John. Because they have to endure to the end, and, and all those things that Jesus Christ says to that little flock to get them through the tribulation. Now, everything in the Book of John is true. It's not untruth, right? right. What's where's the verse right here? Rightly dividing the word of truth. It's all truth. Right. It's just not all to you. It's just not all about you. We just saw one where Peter says, well, you need to work righteousness. Paul says, no, you're accepted. We've seen, you know, Jesus and, and, and Peter say, you know, you need to tithe. You need to tithe. Paul says, you just need to be a cheerful giver. Ready to distribute. Ready to distribute. The The issue there is, is giving in, in both cases. Right. Jesus Christ, when he's talking about the, that, the, the disciples' prayer, what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer, he says, you better, you need to forgive other people so that you can be forgiven. And if you don't, you won't be forgiven. Paul tells you you've forgiven of all of your sins. Th those are different. Mm -hmm. And you can do all the spiritual gymnastics you want to. They're, they're different. That's why we got to go back to Romans eleven thirteen. It says Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. The issue is not Paul. I magnify mine office. office. The issue is the office there. Uh, let's go back to Ephesians uh, 3. This is, this is the information. So, um, uh, verse 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You have come to understand Paul's information to us by reading. Right. Reading, not reading books about the Bible, but reading nope. the Bible. Yep. Okay. And look at verse 5. It's a very important verse. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now we're going to come back. I want to pay attention to that issue where it says by the Spirit. Verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister. Right? He is the apostle, but he's one minister. I mean, clearly there are other, there are other ministers of the gospel, the grace of God, right? Yeah, ministering the grace Apollos, of God. Aquila, Priscilla, Timothy, Titus, Mark sometimes was with him. I mean, Barnabas. Luke, yeah, Barnabas. Well, yeah, exactly. All those people were, were were helping him. Okay, but there was only one apostle of the Gentiles. Right. Right. Okay. Whereof I was, it was made a minister according to the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am the less and the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What Paul teaches were not searchable before mm -hmm. Paul came on. Until they were, re until the Lord Jesus Christ revealed this information to Paul, the things that Paul preaches were unsearchable. In other words, you couldn't go find them in the Old Testament. Right. You can't go back in, in in the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and find the gospel of the grace of God or the dispensation of grace or the church of body of Christ because it's not there. Okay, they, those, those items are unsearchable. Verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The angels look down and see, the, see what the church of body of Christ is doing, and they understand the manifold wisdom of God. There was a part of God's wisdom that they didn't understand until the church of body of Christ was revealed. And now they look down. Before... 
did the angels teach Israel, or did the Is or did Israel teach the angels? The angels told Angel angels yeah. ministered and taught Israel, right? right. Yeah. It's different today. Today, the angels are learning by watching us. Right. It's a completely different program because it's a different time. Right. It's a totally different time. Keep your hand in Ephesians three, and I want you to see it something in um, the Colossians two. I'm going to skip over this issue to fulfill, fulfill the word of God, and we'll come back to it. But verse 25, uh, Colossians, I'm sorry, Colossians 1. Colossians oh, 1, I'm sorry. Okay. He says, Where have I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God? Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Okay, mm -hmm. look at what he says in Ephesians. In 3 verse 5 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles by the prophets of the spirit okay now it's not the same words but it's the same sentiment yeah you guys right. you guys see that in both passages he's saying hey my information nobody knew it before mm -hmm. but now it's revealed okay and it's revealed to his holy apostles and prophets and how is it revealed that's very important how it's revealed by his spirit, spirit capital s, capital s. Means the, Holy the Holy Spirit. Spirit. It's revealed to now the, the the Holy Apostles there and the prophets, those are the people working with Paul. Okay. But it's by the Holy Spirit. Apollos, Apollos and, and the others. But it's by the Spirit. And it's very important to understand. This kind of goes maybe with what you were talking about with Acts a little bit, and maybe not. But if you go back two thousand years. And how did information get communicated, right? Today, we're getting ready to go to Mexico in, in November, and we're checking our phones so that we can te I can text and phone, so I can have instant communication, basically anywhere in the world, no matter where in the world I am. They didn't have that in Paul's day, right? right? It was a long time. So if we said Paul gets revelation, so Paul's teaching, he's, he's, he's revealed some information to to the people that labor with him, and now now those people have gone out. Paul's in Corinth, he's baptizing people. And then all of a sudden he gets the revelation that, hey, you don't need to baptize, where he comes to the realization that baptism isn't for us today, right? He says, oh, I thank God I only baptized a few of you guys. Right, because God sent me not to baptize, but what? To preach he's the gospel awesome. of God. Okay, so at that moment, 1 Corinthians 1, at that moment, Paul's done baptizing. Mm -hmm. Paul never baptizes again after that. How did the rest of the people know that they should not baptize and that that's not part of the program? You had to send them a letter. Had to send them a letter. It'd take forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or send somebody. Right. Okay. Or the Spirit would reveal it. Well, I was going to say that there was, that was where there was people yes. in the congregation that was gifted. Well, we'll look at that in a sec. You're, exact, right. you're exactly right. Because there was a letter sent. There and there was process. somebody in each local assembly that would reveal the the let that a letter was scripture or that a letter was not scripture. There'd be somebody that could identify it in there. Okay. Yeah. It says it was revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? By the spirit. By the spirit. That's where we think about in, when he, they talk about the the gift of prophecy. It's not the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. It's not like what the prophets did prophesying the future in the Old Testament. The gifts of prophecy is where the uh, the Spirit would reveal something to, to somebody in the local assembly, and then they would go and teach it. You've heard you probably heard people say a minister will stand up and say, "Let the words of this prophecy f fall or, or or be true." A lot of times, you know, there really isn't because. They're really using the word wrong, and, and I don't think they really mean what they say, but that that was the case. There would be somebody in a local assembly that would get a revelation from the Spirit, and then they would prophesy it. They would, re, they would reveal it. Um, but Paul always got the information first. So the, the information went to Paul. The, Lord, the risen Lord Jesus Christ would reveal it to Paul. At that moment, then the Spirit could begin to reveal it. To, and he could do it two ways. Divine revelation. The Holy Spirit could just come and say, "Hey, Joe, this is the program today. It's there's been a change, or there's here's more information." Mm -hmm. 
this is what I'm giving you. Next time you see Paul, he can give you a little more detail. But to your point, look at what look over at uh, 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians thirteen. I like it. I like it. I tell you what, I think a guy could make a million bucks somehow, and I wish I did it. I'll take a little aside here. Because you have the, the, the phone net for your Bible. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of really good ones, right? But I haven't found one yet that lets you have the Bible open in two different spots at the same time. Well. Yeah. And, and that would be great. I was trying to hold. You said hold that a minute ago. I was trying to hold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, I keep talking about it. I should, probably, I should find somebody that can do it. But if you can figure out a program have to have you open, open, open. open two yeah. things open at the same time. <laughs> uh, that's work. That's... You know, the only thing ruder than somebody in the audience is phone ringing is the guy speaking's phone ringing. <laughs> okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And that is not what I want. Uh, we will come back to that. 1 Corinthians 9. Nope. Oh, here it is. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. Okay. Oh, yeah, right there. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy forbid not to speak with tongues let all be things be done decently and in order uh, we don't need to deal with the, adi the addition of tongues they needed tongues at this point in time because they didn't have the completed word of god which we'll see in a minute we do have the completed word of god now what i want you to see those verse 37 if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge the things that i write unto you are the commandments of the lord there was somebody in the local assembly that would identify what was scripture and what wasn't scripture now, it's interesting, too, in Corinth, we know Paul wrote at least two other letters to Corinth. First Corinthians is actually Second Corinthians, and Third Corinth and Second Corinthians is actually Third or Fourth Corinthians. <laughs> now, but why aren't those other two? Everybody says, okay, well, we've got lost books of gospel. Lost books. Why isn't the book of Jude and the book of Enoch, or the book of Jude is in the Bible, but the book of Enoch and the, the, the gospel of Peter, and, and what about these other two letters that Paul wrote? And what about the, where's the letter to Laodicea and, and all these things? They weren't scripture. Right. God didn't want them in. The local assembly would get a letter from Paul, and the first person, the, the prophet, the, the person appointed, would read that, and he would supernaturally be able to say, yep, that one's pro that one's scripture. This is the word of God. And this one, now this is just personal letters. There's good stuff in there, but it's not scripture. That also tells you the Bible wasn't decided by a Ro the Roman Catholic Church in the year 300. It was... So the immediate question that should come up then is well what was going on in Thessalonica then that they got fooled by that letter somebody wasn't paying attention or somebody wasn't doing their job because right? they got that fake letter mm -hmm. as if saying by Paul somebody didn't identify correctly what was going on there but what I want you to see when he read so that's there were two ways it would be revealed the, su the, the spirit could supernaturally reveal it to somebody or Paul would write a letter, and when it got to that local assembly, somebody would say, yep, that's scripture, or that's not. Now, the prophet will also be responsible for making copies, right? Think about what he tells the Colossians. Make sure that you that you give you, uh, give this letter to Laodicea, and you read the letter from, Laod from Laodicea. You think they gave the original? No. No, 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 no. Yeah, they made a copy. What about what people wanted to study? See, think about it. Paul tells us to study, right? There wasn't a collated Bible in each place at that time. If somebody wanted to come down and study the letter, the last letter that Paul had wrote, written, you think that they're going to let them have the original and no. take it home to study by <laughs> candlelight? No. There was a scribe that was making copies. Yeah. Paul was saying something in the future when he wrote in 
chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, where it says, uh, um, charity never fails, but whether it be prophecies, verse 8, they shall fail, whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Yeah. So, and he knew that they were going to cease. So, you know, he's, um, in other words, he's, he's realizing that, I don't know if he's going to realize, realize that he's going to be the one that finishes the, the completed word or not, but, uh, no, you're right, and, and and so let's 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 do this again. Keep a hand in First Corinthians thirteen, and come back with me to Colossians one. There are some things here that will really help with a person's Bible study if you understand the gravity and the appreciation of what's being said. Uh, Colossians one twenty five. Okay. Where am I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now the sense there is to complete the word of God. Right. Okay. When the last book Paul wrote was 2 Timothy. When 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 he signed his name to 2 Timothy at that moment scripture was complete. That tells you every book had to be written before that. So everybody said, well, what about 2 Peter 3, where he talks about Paul's, all of Paul's epistles? I don't take that to be all of Paul's epistles. I take that to be all of Paul's epistles that he had written at that moment. Because if not, then this verse can't be true. If if Paul's writings, if, some, if something else besides Paul's writings completed the Word of God, then this verse can't be true. Okay? This verse is true. So Paul completed the Word of God. So let's go back to what Glenn was talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse um, 8. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, he's not talking that if somebody had a prophetic, a truly prophetic utterance, that, 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 that that's going to fail. The gift of prophecy is going to is no longer be that the gift of tongues is going to stop. Um, the gift of knowledge is going to stop. Now that supernatural gift where there's no way you could know something scripturally is what he's talking about. You couldn't, how did that, that, that information that Paul had get revealed to somebody that wasn't around Paul, that was a minister of the dispensation of grace through the spirit revealing it through knowledge and then, then prophesying in it. Verse nine, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Right, we have partial knowledge, and that makes sense, right? If the if the by if, if he's writing this in First Corinthians, so you got eight more chapters of Acts to do, plus his the, the years he was in prison. Okay, so they didn't have the completed word of God. There was no way they could have complete knowledge. Okay, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the question is, well, what's what's the perfect there? Well, verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. But now we see through a glass darkly, right? We, we, we can't see everything. Paul's saying, Paul's saying this in Acts 20. We look into a glass and it's dark. We, we can't see through it. It's, it's not reflecting back and we can't see through it. But then face to face, right? When we have full knowledge, when that which is perfect has come, then we will be able to see face to face, right? The it will be clear. Now I know in part, mm -hmm. but then I shall know, even as also I am known. And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The question of verse 10 is, what's the perfect? But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So there's the, there, there's two thoughts on it. One doesn't really make any sense. People will say, well, that which is perfect has come. Well, when Jesus comes back at, at the resurrection, at the rapture. The, the only problem with that is that means we'll never have complete knowledge. That means there's always going to be unknown stuff. There's always going to be additional revelation from God that's out there that we can't know. We're never going to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. When that which is perfect has come, when the Word of God is perfect, when the Word of God is complete, 
then that which is in part shall be done away. See, once the word of God is complete, we don't there don't need prophecies. Well, that, that idea that, that when Jesus comes back, that leaves the door open for all these uh, people say, "Well, God spoke to me. God told me this." That's right. Said, yeah. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. And even if they were to do that, if you go back and you read the issues of prophecies and you read the issues of tongues, two or three people, if one person says it and it's true, nobody else repeats it, it's all done in order and, and things like that, you're, you're exactly right. So the stuff you see today in the church is so wrong because that stuff's done today, but even they don't even do it the way the Bible says it's supposed to be done. No. Right? So in verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, that's the word of God. When the word of God is complete, yeah. when it's it, it's perfect, it's complete, then that which is in part, be done away. partial prophecies, partial yeah. tongues, partial knowledge, it's going to be done away. It won't be needed We'll have complete knowledge. Yeah. Well, another thing, too, you say well, when Jesus, some people believe it's when Jesus comes back, but he is the word, this is the word. Right. So when he's completed, then... And Paul just told you his what the the information revealed to him fulfilled the word of God, completed the word of God. So that'll help you a lot of ways. Let you know that all the stuff that all the scholars tell you the books were written later, a hundred years or after the fact, or by by somebody, you know, by like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't really written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but maybe Mark was in the year one hundred or something, and then the other three guys copied from him and you know that's just not true. That's just not true. It is crazy stuff. For, I mean, it's just not true. For one, Paul quotes Luke. So if Mark was written after Paul and Luke copied Mark, how did Paul end up quoting Luke? Or, at, yeah, the book of Luke. I mean, it, it's just right. messed up. It also tells you when people walk around and say, well, Jesus told me. I got a message. No, you didn't. Everything God has to tell you, he wrote down in a book. Mm -hmm. You don't get the, the, the funny feeling in your tummy is not God. Right. God didn't tell you what job to take. He expects you to take the best of the two jobs, three jobs, whatever, whatever you have. He's giving you guidance in His Word about how to make those decisions. God didn't tell you what car to buy, but He does have some things to say about how you spend your money. Well, there's wisdom that comes from the studies of the God's Word. That's right. And when you make decisions, you make decisions based on wisdom. That that's yeah. exactly right. And that, that's that's the issue. You know, I, my daughter was just between jobs here, and she had to make some decisions. She had to make some thinking. By the way, well, there were some pros and cons to everything, but she had to sit down and think it through. Well, as life, what do we want to do? We want to, we want to ultimately, and this is not a nice thing to say, but ultimately we want to blame God for our own bad decisions. Right? God's not making our decisions for us. That's Israel's program. The church, the body of Christ, we're mature saints. God gives us some information and says, okay, guys, you're a saint of the Most High God. This is who you are in Christ. Go to the circumstances of life and apply what you've learned. That's right. Don't The circumstances of life are not telling you uh, other, than right. the, uh, right. other than the natural results for sin. I mean, you, if you're running a red light and you get in a car accident, that is, that's, I mean, that's, common sense, right? But that's not God that made the accident happen. That's just reality. But the circumstances of life are not teaching you, are not how God's revealing himself to you. He wrote you a book. He wants you to study that book and in the circumstances of life, apply the information here, like you said, the wisdom, the understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge, and go apply it. You know, Helen up in Vancouver, you say all the time, God gave you a brain, he expects you to use it. That's where we talked earlier, we're accepted of God but sometimes we don't live like we're accepted of God. And it's not that God's changed, it's that we don't measure up. There's an issue between our standing before God, and those are the issues we looked at earlier too. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable. That's our standing before God. Now, do we live like that every day? No. But we should. That's the goal. Now, how do you do that? By being, by staying steadfast and grounded in the gospel, in the faith, and in Paul's gospel, and don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. The teachings about a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. That First Corinthians 13, because it goes perfectly with the issue with Paul saying that that he what he writes is to fulfill the word of God, because that was the problem the Colossians were have. Go back to Colossians. Colossians were getting moved off of the hope, the hope of the gospel, through philosophy and vain deceit and the tradition of man, the rudiments of the world. 
Look at 2 verse 8, chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the rudiments, yeah. the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not yeah, after Christ. Christ. Look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body, by joints and bands having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. You know, the problem there in Colossae was they were getting away from the Word of God as their final authority. Instead of holding Christ as their head, mm -hmm. they, I mean, they were doing good things in Colossae. But they were getting starting to slowly get moved away because they weren't staying steadfast, and they would they had really lost their hope. We we've seen that study, yeah, right? They have lost that 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 hope of the resurrection. Is one of the things that we're getting weak kneed about, if you will. Okay, so what they do? They turn to philosophy, the deceit, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, looking out there for something to just be that last little piece. Mm -hmm. And isn't I mean, you, go to the Christian bookstore today. And see how many self-help books do you get that take the wisdom of the world, go find some verse from some book you've never heard about, wrap it around and say, okay, that's what you're supposed to do. No. Keep Christ as your head. Keep focused on Christ. Keep Christ as your head. Understand who you are in Christ and go live out of that identity. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. This issue of false humility, this issue of worshiping of angels... What is that? That's just legalism and religion. False humility, that's legalism. Worshiping of angels, that's religion. That's all that is. It looks like it's something, but it's nothing. I mean, humility, that's a good thing, right? But the issue is to hold Christ as the head. You hold Christ as the head by, by understanding you have the completed Word of God. You don't need that other stuff. Chapter 2, or verse 10. Ver, uh, verse 9 for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are what complete in him you're complete in Christ you don't need those other things that he's talking about there you don't need human philosophy right. vain traditions all that stuff the answers for what is going on in your life are found in this book specifically Romans through Philemon because that's to us today That's those are the books Paul wrote mm-hmm if, if if you claim a verse that's not in Romans through Philemon as and, and you're going to claim that as 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 your as your verse or, or the verse that, that's going to fix whatever problem you're going through, you better be able to find a corollary verse in Paul's epistles. Right. If Paul didn't say it, it's not specifically to you. Now there are things that Peter says that Paul says as well. I mean, let's be very clear here. There are things that Jesus says that Paul says. Mm -hmm. Now there are also things that Jesus says that Paul says the opposite. Peter says one thing. Paul says the opposite. You just got to un understand those issues. Um, go back to Colossians 1. And again, in every book, in every single book, even Philemon, Paul defends his unique ministry. Mm -hmm. Usually more than once. Because the unique ministry of the Apostle Paul, not only is it attacked or mocked today, it was like that in his day. I know. Yeah. His 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 ministry got going, and then, like he told Timothy, all those in Asia have left me. Then they didn't say they left Christ. They didn't lose their salvation or any, any of those kinds of things. You can't lose your salvation. But they didn't lose Christ, leave Christ, but they lost Paul, left Paul. They left the distinctive ministry of Paul, the dispensation of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God and, and all the things that come with it. Okay. Okay, verse 26, Colossians 1, verse 26. Even the mystery, that's what was revealed to Paul, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now it's made manifest as to his saints. We saw that by the Spirit. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Christ in the body of Christ, 
us in the body of Christ, but also Christ in you individually. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Yes, you have the Spirit in you, but you also have Christ in you. Which is interesting because in other places he tells you, uh, look, uh, you know, grow up into Christ. He tells the Corinthians, until Christ be formed again in you. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. What he's talking about there is as you live by faith, it's Christ living out of you. Think about Galatians. Not I, Look at Galatians 2. In verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not in the Son of God, but of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, you live a life pleasing unto God, by the faith of Christ working in you. It's not you that goes out and lives a life pleasing unto God. It's Christ working in you yeah. is how you live a life pleasing unto God. Because we always get in the way. Yeah. It's when we walk after Christ, walk after the Spirit, that we live a life pleasing unto God. That we, that we get to the point where we can say, as Paul did, not I, but Christ I liveth in me. in me. Go back to Colossians. And I was going to move, I'm going to move on from that, but, but please don't, don't um, underappreciate the issue of Christ in you. Right, I know. Right. Don't underestimate the issue of Christ in you. Yep. Verse 28, whom we preach, that's Christ, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. In verse 28 there, you see a few things. You see justification, sanctification, and glorification in that verse. Hmm. Warning every man, right? Warning every man that there's, there's, there's a day of judgment coming. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a day of judgment coming. Teaching every man, that's our sanctification. Right? You get saved, okay, you, you heed the warning, you get saved, and then you need to be taught. That's your right. sanctification, that's that's your walk here on earth. Right. Teaching every man in all wisdom, that's the words you just brought up, Glenn, that issue of wisdom. Why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is not assuming that he is not thinking that he can take billions of people in the generations to come and present them before Jesus, and Paul can run out and say, hey, this guy was perfect. The issue of perfect is being truly furnished into all good works. Right. right. We've seen that in Second Timothy, okay? Mature. Mature. Whom we preach. Every man. There's a day of judgment coming. And the very person that gets rejected is going to be the one that sits on the throne and judges him. Yeah. You ever think about that? He's going to, that person that rejects the gospel all their life is going to stand before Christ. The one he rejected. The one he rejected. The one who died for him. And he said, you know what I did? And Christ said, yeah, you, you, you did that. But I died for your sin. Yeah, but I... Yeah, you did that. But I died for your sins. The very person that says just believe is going to judge the person. It's a, a, a phenomenal. It's just a phenomenal thing to me. They'll be without excuse. They will be without excuse. Teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's where you want to be. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Or I'm sorry, yeah, 3.16. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is yeah. profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, mm -hmm. Why? That the man of God may be perfect. Now here's your definition of perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. Mm -hmm. So when Paul wants to present every man perfect, he wants to present every man truly furnished unto all good works. It's an issue of reward. Because 
our reward in heaven is based on the doctrinal understanding we got inside of us and how that works out of us. And we have to learn so we can... Exactly. The last thing he brings up in this chapter now is, is his issue of his labor. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You know, all the laboring that Paul does, all the laboring that we do, all the striving that we do for the gospel, when we do it in our own energy, it's not going to produce anything. Mm -hmm. And Paul understands that here. All that he went through, he just told them in verse 24 that he rejoiced in their sufferings. And he went through that, and he labored, and he strived according to his working, God's which working. works in me mightily. He didn't rely on himself. He knew he'd fold like a house of cards when under, under the sufferings and the persecutions that he went through. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went through terrible, terrible, terrible things. It's amazing he was able to, 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 to get through it. But he was able to get through it not because of Paul, but because of Christ God. working yeah. in him mightily. mightily. See, when you can get to the place like Paul does, where it's no longer us that's the issue. It's Christ in us that's the issue. Yep. Look at two more verses. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Um, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which is bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. See, he labored more abundantly than all the apostles. Not because he was so great. Not because he had this great... Not because he'd read the books, right? What is it? Eight things of effective people, of highly effective people, or whatever the name of that book is. He didn't read that book. It's because he relied on Christ in yeah. him. He let God... He, work through him and he was able to do what he was able to do what was that the, reference? didn't rely on himself 1st Corinthians. First Corinthians 15 10 he let the grace of God work through him to accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish mm -hmm. okay alright that brings us to the end of Colossians 1 seems like we've been here a long time we took quite a few breaks but we'll get into chapter 2 next week well I was Difficult for me at first to not say, but like to say, you say, live like who you are in Christ Jesus. And, and like under the law, it was a performance base. Um, and so the things that 